Jim, thanks so much for the time. As we, uh, as we kick off this four-game series, so much has been made of the eight wins for the Red Sox, zero for the Yankees. What intrigues you most about this series heading in? Well, what intrigues me most is that the Yankees have a two-and-a-half game lead, so they must be beaten up on a lot of other teams, which they are doing. A lot of those games were one pitch, one hit. And are the Red Sox going to go 18-0? and 0? I don't think so. So it's, I think it's a big psychological advantage for the Yankees, and that really starts tonight. If you wanted to match up this game and handicap it, you'd say this is the night that streak ends. Jabba Chamberlain's pitching great. Smoltz has been getting killed by lefties. The Yankees will have seven of them in the lineup. They're playing great baseball. The Red Sox aren't scoring runs. All of that being said, all of you guys that have followed baseball know Red Sox probably win 13 to 1. <laughs> hey, Jim, it's Dan, please. You know, getting back to John Smoltz, you know, coming back from the injury, he's, you know, Joe and I touched on a little bit. You know, the velocity, the radar gun readings are not quite what they were, but he's still in the low to mid 90s. But you're not seeing the reaction from hitters, the swings and the misses, him being able to get his fastball in and jamming guys. Do you think it's somewhat of a concern? Is he going to get back to being the John Smoltz that he was a couple seasons ago? Well, Dan, I, he may have to try to figure out a way. Now, uh, you know, I don't know what you guys, I know Joe went through some injuries, and I don't know what adjustments you made in your career, but eventually you find out that you can't get hitters out with that same natural stuff that you did when you were in your 20s. I thought at first that it was the breaking ball, but I talked to Terry Francona. He said his slider's been sharp. He's happy with his breaking ball, but number one, he's pitching in the American League. He's facing some tougher lineups. He's not getting his fastball inside. Number one, he doesn't have as much on it, and he isn't getting it in there as often as he did against the National League lineups, particularly against lefties, and that's the big difference. As you guys know, pitching starts with command of the fastball. I don't care how hard you throw, but you got to be able to command it and he hasn't been able to establish that inside part of the plate and uh, he's going to have to try to figure out a way to may maybe make some adjustments and sort of change his philosophy of pitching. Kitty, it's uh, it's Joe McGrain. I'd like to know if you could expound on that uh, a little bit further. I am kind of sensing uh, where you're going but maybe you could just talk a little bit more about how the transition is difficult for a National League pitcher to go to the AL as opposed to vice versa. Well, I think, first of all, league to league, the bottom third in the National League I don't think is as powerful as the America. I think the lineup's up and down on as powerful. You don't have the designated hitter, and I think you have more home run threats over here, and so I think that's what makes it more difficult from a pitcher's standpoint to go from the National League to the American League, and I think that's one of the, one of the big things. And then in general, hitters are getting better and better. They're stronger. They can dive into the ball. You can't strike any fear in him and push him off the plate. I was talking to Andy Pettit, and he said, I remember the days when the Tigers had Cecil Fielder, Rob Deere, Mickey Tettleton. You know, I, I could figure out a way on my good days to pitch to those guys. Now you're looking even at a team like the Orioles with, you know, Adam Jones and Huff and Brian Roberts and these guys. And he said, up and down the lineup, it's just tougher to pitch today than it ever was, particularly in the American League. Jim, it's John Hart. Um, Jabba Chamberlain, uh, the Yankees are, uh, obviously have somebody they, they love, and they've talked a lot about protecting him early in the year. There's this 160-inning uh, limit. Uh, what's your take on that? What do you see um, with that? Uh, is that going to happen is that, uh, uh, or not? Well, it sounds like it is. It, it's kind of hard for me to believe that a young kid like this, as strong as he is, he's got three great put-away pitches. He's pitching better and better. And now when he hits 160 innings, you're going to say, well, go to the bullpen or take him out of the rotation. I mean, I'm a little bit biased on that in that pitchers are bigger, stronger. They're in better condition. I think Mickey Lolich pitched 300 innings six out of eight years. I know at age 36, I pitched over 300 innings. That doesn't make me Superman. It's the way you train yourself. And I just think sooner or later they got to take the gloves off and let these kids learn how to pitch without all their power stuff, and then they can pitch more innings instead of relying on a power pitch every pitch, every inning, and as a result you see more injuries, and now they have to start limit their innings. Uh, I don't buy it, but, of course, I, I don't understand, and, John, you being a general manager know how important it is to protect your investment and protect your players, and I'm sure that's what the Yankees are looking at. Kitty, uh, Joe, with the uh, follow-up, I know Johnny Sane was very inspirational in, uh, in, in your career and, and about teaching you not to be maximum effort on, on every pitch. Uh, 
I know it's a it's broad based, but uh, are are these young talented pitchers are they throwing enough? I know you you threw as as often as you could. Yeah, uh, I I don't think they are. I think they're hot house too much. But again, I understand the the financial aspects. You got a number one pick. You've invested a lot of money, and and you've got agents there saying, "Don't wear my guy out." Uh, I always like the theory: it'll rust out, for it'll wear out. And I love to. I'll give you a quick story. I pitched nine innings one day, and the next day I'm in the bullpen tossing, and Stan Williams, who was a veteran pitcher, had just gotten traded, and he sees me throwing, got traded to our team. He said, what are you doing? You pitched nine innings yesterday. I said, I like to exercise a little every day. If I don't throw today, I'm going to be stiffer tomorrow. Ten years later, he's my pitching coach with the Yankees. He's throwing batting practice every day. I said, Steamer, how's your arm feel? He said, feels great. I said, if you'd have thrown more when you played, you'd still be pitching. <laughs> that, that's a great story. Take it to you. Uh, take it back to the to today, the current day. And and David Ortiz shows up at Yankee Stadium, and the fans are going to be there. You know what the atmosphere is going to be like. Take a guess for us at the reception Ortiz will receive, given all that's been in the news regarding Big Poppy lately. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that the Yankee fans are going to rain down on him because of what Alex Rodriguez went through and Manny Ramirez. The question I have is, how are these names leaking out? Uh, you know, I don't say to protect these guys, are they guilty, are they innocent? I wish the whole list was out, but that's not the way the law reads. Somebody, whether it's the government or the judges or the legal system, is leaking these names out, and that's, that's the thing that's not right and as a result, uh, Alex and Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz are going to hear it tonight. If one comes out, I, I wish they were all out. But, you know, I think we all wear a black hat in baseball for knowing that this has been going on all these years and none of us stepped forward and said, hey, this is affecting the record book more than anything else. But in terms of your original question, David Ortiz is going to handle it. He knows it. And I think like Alex Rodriguez hears around the league, he'll be able to handle it.